Today I'm at the magnificent fortress of Lewisburg on Cape Breton Island here in beautiful Nova Scotia. And I'm speaking to Daniel Pritchard, a uh, historian here at the fortress. And I must say I'm very impressed with this site. It's, it's an extraordinary place. So perhaps you can tell us something about the genesis of it, why it was here, how it was built, the history of the French, and how this place came to be. Yeah, so you gotta look at it. Those are just two histories, one of the 18th century history and one of the history of the reconstruction that happened in the 20th century. So in the 20th century, it was decided after a commission done by Judge Ivan C. Rand, uh, it was kind of a, to look at the economic problems caused by the downturn of the coal industry in Cape Breton and the economic downturn of other industries in maritime as well. And one of his suggestions is that rebuilding the fort, rebuilding the French fortress at Lewisburg would be a good, for essentially lack of a better term, a make work project for the displaced and unemployed coal miners that had lost their jobs due to the, the collapse of the mining industry. Uh, so that was the genesis right there, but the genesis had to go into things like research. So who lived in Lewisburg? What did the buildings look like? What did the furniture look like? What did uh, uh, people's health outcomes look like? Uh, what was the parish like? So how many people died in Lewisburg? How many people were baptized in Lewisburg? And luckily, all of these records still existed, so we were able to reconstruct the fortress or part of the fortress that you see today. So we have about 25% of the fortress uh, or this town that was here in the 18th century. So the, the individuals that uh, trained the Cape Breton coal miners, yep. so where did they come from? Because uh, these would have been coal miners, right? And they wouldn't be slaters or they wouldn't be carpenters or they wouldn't be bricklayers. Yeah, so actually a lot of uh, people with specialized skills, masons, uh, carpenters, uh, doing older style of carpentries, carpentry work, uh, were brought in from Europe. So in Europe at the time it was post-World War II, so there was a lot of reconstruction going on there as well. People were building these skills and practicing these skills in Europe. And it was just an easy transfer to come to Lewisburg and kind of help to uh, bring this town or part of this town back to life. Now, why were the French here? To be honest, I mean, it's foggy today, it's cold, it's damp. The simplest answer is the cod fishery. Uh, but it goes back to why they were in Lewisburg. It goes back to war and diplomacy in the 18th century. So Lewisburg was founded as a result of the War of the Spanish Succession and the subsequent Treaty of Utrecht. And part of that Treaty of Utrecht is the French will lose their territories in Newfoundland and what we call Acadia, which is you know, mainland modern-day Nova Scotia. Uh, so the French from Plaisance, which was their, their main outport or community in Newfoundland, had to go somewhere else, and they decided to come to Cape Breton. And they came, well, they arrived here on September 2nd of 1713 uh, on a ship called the Semslac. It was about 114 men, 10 women, and maybe 23, 24 children. So it was a small, you know, small group, less than 200 people. And they were here for the winter. Uh, they were given supplies from France and Quebec, helped out with giving supplies. But they were in for a very rough year that winter. You know, winter set in early uh, and lasted until the end of May. So it wasn't a rough first year, but uh, Lewisburg then would become the biggest of all the communities that the French do find on this island in the 18th century. Lewisburg becomes the, the, the most populous. And that is because of the cod fishery. How big was it in the 18th century? Well, that depends. It depends on what year you look at. Uh, so. I, in the 1750s, maybe a population of around 4,000 people within the walls. Uh, so you're looking at, you know, maybe 2,000-ish people in the year 1744, which is what we portray in our interpretation today. So maybe 2,000 people would have lived here. Well, was, is that a large population for the 18th century? Um, yes and no. Uh, in a French context, it is a very large population. Uh, but if you look at some of the, uh, the population of towns of Boston and New York, they were much, much larger than what Lewisburg would have been in the 18th century as far as population. So what happened to the French? Why aren't they still here? Well, that is a very good question. Uh, again, it's war and diplomacy. So Lewisburg's actually besieged twice. Uh, first time in 1745 by New Englanders with British naval support. And then after that is done, they're actually sent back to France, a lot of them. There's a few French people that actually stay while the New Englanders are here, but most of them are deported back to France. Uh, but Again, after that war, which is the War of the Austrian Succession, there is the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, and uh, Louisbourg is given back to the French. They just gave it back? Well, it was a trade. So there was other areas, like, it's just part of an empire, and the, maybe they wanted some other spot, and the English said, well, I'll trade you this for that. But like kids, you know, I, I want your sandwich, you take my <laughs> oh, sandwich. All right. You all know, right. very much like that kind of a scenario, and Louisbourg is handed back to the French, and the French will be here for another nine years, from 49 till about 50, till 58, when you have the second siege of Lewisburg, uh, which was conducted by British professional armies 
and of course, again, British naval support. But you can actually tell the difference between the two sieges because it was conducted professionally in the second siege. So there's all kinds of uh, ruins of redans, redoubts, all these kind of uh, siege infrastructure that a professional army would build that the New Englanders didn't build in 45. And of course, after about six, seven weeks of uh, being besieged, uh, Louisbourg capitulates again. And they are deported back to France again. This time, unlike the first siege, they capitulate without the honors of war. Well, Daniel, I have to say this chapel is magnificent. It's absolutely beautiful. Perhaps you can explain a little bit about the chapel, its construction, and its purpose within the town itself. So it was essentially supposed to be the military chapel, but they never got around to building a parish church here, so this becomes the parish church as well. Uh, so they're probably doing mass here several times a day, being a Catholic, uh, well, predominantly Catholic community, so there would have been mass here at multiple times throughout the day. But it is a military chapel, essentially, and that's why we have a picture of uh, uh, King Louis IX, uh, otherwise also known as uh, Saint Louis. Uh, so he was a patron saint of the military, he was the king of France in the 13th century, and he participated in the 7th and 8th Crusades. And that's why you see in his hand the, uh, the nails uh, from the crucifix and the thorn of crowns that he supposedly bought, brought back from the Holy Land. I notice that there are artifacts in here. I, I see a couple of statues, uh, I see uh, gilding. Is, is that gold? Gold gilding, yes. Gold gilding? Yep. I, they had that? They certainly did. Uh, you're going to see it in a lot of uh, picture frames. Uh, you'll see it a lot there, uh, kind of decoration and panels like you see it here. So it was something that was done in the 18th century. So would all the townspeople come here for, for mass? This would be where people would come for mass. So you would probably see your upper class people sitting in these benches. There were no pews. And the, uh, upper class, uh, the lower class people rather would, would sit down or stand up rather. So. And, and I noticed that there's ships in the windows. Yep. Why would they be in the window? They, they are votive boats, and they were probably put there as an offering or just kind of something for good luck or good fortune on travel back to France or to wherever the, the, the destination might be. So Louisbourg was very connected to not just France, but the whole world, pretty much the whole known world in the 18th century. So there were ships coming and going to Martinique, the New England colonies, back to Quebec, uh, back to France, any other French colonies. So there would have been ships coming in and out of Louisbourg, coming from various destinations and going to destinations. So it was a type of superstition that if you, you yeah. put this in that uh, yeah. it would, would be a lot more than just one, right? Yeah, there probably would have been many at the time. Many of them, yeah. all right. Probably one at each window and then maybe when the voyage got, we got back, you take it down, somebody else would put one up. I'm here speaking to Mallory, the archaeologist here at the Fortress of Lewisburg in the conservation lab. And I have to say, I look around, I see you working on all these artifacts and pieces that you've taken out of the ground. And it's a pity that it's not open to the public, but it isn't, is it? No, so this is kind of a behind the scenes look of what we're doing here at the fortress. Um, so yes, drink it all in. But this is what happens after we bring things back from the field. So after we've excavated, we'll bring them back to the conservation lab and we have a conservationist on staff who will clean and prepare and preserve the objects for storage in our collections. Oftentimes when we bring things back out of the dirt, they're still damp, they're covered with sediment. Um, and we do our best to clean them as archaeologists, but there's still quite a bit more work that needs to go into them before they're ready for long-term storage. So what's, what do you most commonly find? Oh, we find all kinds of things. Um, here at the fortress, we find ceramics and glass. We find different metallic objects like nails. All of the building hardware we find. 
Um, and then also smaller, like personal items, things that we call small finds. So like thimbles, sewing needles, um, all of the small objects that you use as part of your day-to-day -day life, we find those as well. Um, here at the fortress, we are also fortunate, um, and this is quite rare for a site from this time period, but we often find textiles. So particularly in areas that are, have been wet for a long time, like a latrine or a well, if an object falls in there, it tends to be better preserved. And among those objects, we found some textiles, including a knitted cap, socks and stockings, pieces of military uniforms, hat pieces. Um, so that's quite interesting and quite rare for a site from this time period in this region. I notice here on the table you have an artifact in pieces. Mm -hmm. So you're going to try to put this back together again, right? So it's sort of like putting together a jigsaw puzzle, isn't it? It is, it is. Um, and that's one of the most time-consuming parts after the excavation is refitting all of the pieces of the objects back together. You know, we're always keeping an eye out for broken pieces of the same material and making a note of that so that when we come back to the lab, we can try to put the items back together. Now, I do notice that there's a ruins walk. I see that there's a tent out there. I'm assuming that would be for an archaeological dig, yes? Yes, that's right. So, so perhaps you can tell me what a visitor could expect if they come to the fortress and they decide to take a walk through the ruins. Along that walk, you'll see lots of interpretive plaques that talk about the structures that were once there that, you, that haven't been recreated, but that you can still kind of see some archaeological signs for. So the first site that you'll see on your way down the Ruins Rock will be the Brothers of Charity Hospital. So Lewisburg actually had quite a large hospital that was run by a religious organization at the time. Um, and those ruins are pretty well preserved. Um, and there's a plaque you can read that talks more about that history. And as you keep going down the ruins walk, you'll see you'll pass through the Morpra Gate. Um, the Morpra Gate was the most ornate of any of the gates of Lewisburg, and it was designed to impress people who were sailing into the harbor. So you'll pass through those old fortifications, um, basically right through where the gate used to be, and then you'll come upon our big white archaeological dome. Mm. And that's where we're storing all of our equipment for the bioarchaeological field school that is currently running out on Rochford Point. Biological, I'm assuming, are human remains sort of things, yes? Yes, exactly. So bioarchaeology is the study of the human body and the remains that are left behind. Um, and we're very fortunate to be partnered with Dr. Amy Scott at the University of New Brunswick. New Brunswick. And um, she's the uh, bioarchaeologist who's running the field school in collaboration with Parks. Um, and her specialty is the remains of the human body. Um, so what we're doing is excavating a 18th century cemetery site out there. Uh, and the reason we're doing it is because all of Rochford Point is currently at risk of coastal erosion. And we expect that we'll lose much of the existing land out there to erosion. Um, the cemetery site is right in the way of that erosion. So we've partnered with Dr. Scott to come in, exhume the individuals buried there so that we can move them to a more protected place. The field school generally runs for four weeks every summer, and it's an opportunity to train young up-and-coming archaeologists on the field schools that they'll need when they go forward in their careers. Now, what can you learn from the bodies? Oh, so much. So for every individual that we take out of the ground, um, we are able to establish kind of a basic profile of their age at time of death, um, their sex, and whether they had any traumatic injuries that may have contributed to their death or perhaps chronic injuries or diseases that show up in the bones. So your skeleton really serves as a kind of a collection of the history of things that have happened to you throughout your life. So in addition to a basic profile on who these people are, um, we can also do more advanced testing to figure out perhaps where they were born um, and questions like that. So it's a really wonderful opportunity to learn more about the people who lived at Lewisburg and what their lives were like. Now, the, these uh, would be French or would they, would they be New Englanders or somebody else that was buried in there? How could you tell the difference? Ah, well, that's an excellent question. It depends on lots of factors to determine where somebody might be from. Um, and... So at this time, New Englanders were generally speaking of Anglican faith, and the French were of the Catholic faith. Uh, and those different faith communities had different styles of burial at this time. At this time, people of the Catholic faith were generally buried in only a shroud without a coffin. 
um, whereas folks of an Anglican faith were maybe buried in a shroud and a coffin. And sometimes even we find coffins that have decoration on the front um, that might say somebody's initials or perhaps their regiment and their year, year of burial. So for folks who are buried in coffins or perhaps decorated coffins, we think those individuals are more likely to be New Englanders, whereas folks we find who are just in shrouds, they're more likely to be French, possibly. But another thing we can do is actually test uh, the enamel, the tooth enamel of the people we find, and that can tell us where somebody was born and grew up in the early years of their life. Your teeth? Yes. Now, how could you manage that? <laughs> Well, there are isotopes that become incorporated into the enamel of your teeth as you're developing, um, both as a very young child and as your adult teeth develop. It serves as a record through time of where on the world you were when you consumed those isotopes that then become embedded in your teeth. So we can tell actually if somebody grew up in Europe or if they grew up in New England, for instance. And we do have some folks who we can tell were born in New England and we can tell some folks were actually born here in Lewisburg. And we have both of those communities represented in this burial ground. Here I am with Ian Hart, a military animator here at the Fortress of Lewisburg, and you're going to teach me how to shoot a musket. musket. So I am, sir. And the reason why I put you in a wool uniform is because we don't need static spark, okay? So we put you in wool, wool's a natural material and it won't burn, so you will be kept safe. These guns will throw a little bit of spark, but we'll make sure you're safe and sound and we'll have air protection on you and eye protection and everything we do. So I'll make sure that you're perfectly comfortable before we give you the musket. When I pass you the musket the second time, your gun will be loaded. Okay, and I'll make sure you're steady all the time. A few things I want to go over, Sandy, or La La May, I'll give you a war name. Oh, uh, what does it mean? La Ro, Oars. Oh, okay. You I could, have a war name now. <laughs> right? so, so you could end up in the gallows in France. <laughs> well, that's not very appetizing, <laughs> is it now? Right? But you could, forever. <laughs> See, okay. So. When I put you in this uniform, I brought you over here. I'm going to be, uh, keep away from the tourist. I took away your, uh, any cell phones or any watches, anything like that, to make sure we don't get a static spark with uh, the black powder. So one thing that's important is the word fix. If you hear the word fix, do not move. Stay where you're at. If your gun's up, you stay there until I ask you to put it down. Okay, the next thing you're going to go over is downrange. This is downrange. If somebody appears over the hill, we will fix and we'll stay still until they, they are removed aside. All right, so have you ever fired a musket or a gun before, sir? No. No, okay, so we're gonna go right from the basics. And what this is, is a 1734 Grenadier musket. It's a smooth bore, and it's a flint lock and a muzzle loading gun, okay? So this is a flint, and this is a hard piece of stone which actually scrapes on the frizzen. This is a hammer, and inside here, you see a little touch hole inside of here, and you'll see this is where I'll put my black powder, all right? So once I put my black powder in, I will close this over, and then I will turn around, and I will load the gun from here, and I will spring it. So when I spring it, I'll, I'll load it. When I put this down the side, I'll put it down very slowly like this. And the idea is so I won't have an explosion with my hands, okay? So this is steel and that's steel. If I put it down too rough, I will have an explosion. When I put my ramrod back inside, I will make sure it goes right where it belongs, and you'll see me do this. When I come back to you, my gun will be loaded. So some parts of the gun, this is the butt, this is the cheek plate, and this is the balance point of your gun. That's very important, okay? When I pass you this gun, do not put your finger in the trigger guard. Keep your finger aside like this here, as you can see. The reason for that, I don't need you to fire the gun quickly or uh, uh, by mistake, all right? One of the most important things I'm going to show you today is your feet placement. So I'll get you to stand right here beside me. All right. So if you put your two feet apart at a comfortable pace, the reason for that is if there was a ball in this here gun, it would actually be able to knock you over on your keister. Oh. Okay. So 
Um, so when I give you the gun, I'd like you to put this against your shoulder here. This is a cheek plate, and the reason why it's called a cheek plate, your cheek goes against the plate. The balance point is that you can adjust to suit you, okay? So when I put my gun up, I'm going to watch my head. When my head goes forward, my gun comes up, okay? Just like this, we rock it a little bit. And the reason for that, my arms are short, and my clothing takes up space. So I put this like there, and I'll put it up level with my cheek. I don't bend my head to the gun. My gun comes to my face, just like this, okay? So when I, if I give you the gun and you hear click, that is a misfire. If you have a misfire, it's going to look just like this, okay? A misfire, you have to hold your gun up for 10 seconds in case there is a hot uh, flint in here that will give you a, a, a hang fire, okay? So if you go hold it up for 10 seconds, and when you bring it down, bring it down level, and don't look at it. Keep it away from your face, this way here. That way, if we do have a, a hang fire, it'll go that way on you, okay? All right, so I'm going to pass you this gun just like it's going to be loaded, okay? So here's your gun, okay? If you're not comfortable, you say so. If you're not strong enough to hold the gun, you let me know, and I will support it here for you. So I'm going to come out of here. This is exactly what we're going to do when we're going to fire. So put your gun up. Bring your, yes. Okay, raise your gun a little higher. Straighten up your neck. There you go. Are you comfortable with that stance? I am. Okay, just see if you can pull your trigger back. Take your two fingers. Okay, don't pull it back. Just see if you can reach it. Okay, you're going like that. Okay, put the gun down. Okay, keep it away from your face. So this time we're going to put the gun up. We're going to put it up and we're going to count to 10 seconds in case we have a misfire. Okay, go ahead. Hold it up. Straighten up your neck a little bit. And bring up your gun a little bit. Back on your shoulder. Just like that there. You're comfortable with your feet? I am. Okay, we'll count to 10 seconds. And when you fire, we will go off, put your gun down, and we'll rest right there. And then I'll come over here, and that will be the end of your shot, sir. And I'll take your gun from there, and I will come over. I will spring it and come back, and then I'll load it back up for you if we need to be. All right, sounds good. I didn't get anything to eat. I'm starving. Is there any place I can get something to eat around here? Uh, yeah, there's uh, there's a bakery just down that way. Where? Well, if you, uh, you go down the street, take a left at the fence, you'll be uh, you're right there. It's next to the blacksmith. Uh, is the bread good? I mean, they've been no, stale delicious. bread. No, no, no. It's fresh bread made fresh every morning. All right. If it isn't, I'm going to come back, and we're going to have a different discussion. Oh. I promise? It's All good. right. <laughs> Stop stealing stuff! 